put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Gentlemen, welcome to the 332nd, 333, 333, 333th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey, me, and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. Tom, by the way, is a philanthropist. <laughs> it's true. You, you do stuff for people all the time. He doesn't have huge amount of, amounts of money to give to the local opera company. But, you know, I mean, not like David Koch had, or... David Koch, where, where, where did I hear that name? I don't know. <laughs> We're going to be talking about somebody like that later. I think so. Anyway. we got a picture coming up. We, not yet, because I've got to talk. Oh, okay. Okay. The commercial. Well, I've got to give a commercial, and I've got to, I've got to introduce the show. Every day I get up, and I go to the news, and I find whatever I can about energy and climate change, and... Um, each article, I get a 50 to 55 word synopsis with a link to the original article. I put up 10 to 15 of those every day and uh, put them up on a blog, which is called geoharvey.com. How clever. How clever, a name for which I apologize. I didn't know what I was doing when I was filling the thing out, and I just thought, well, I don't know. I'll just throw something in there and then change it to whatever I can think of. And, of course, I didn't have the opportunity to do that. <laughs> so, anyway... Um, that blog is geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. You can go there and see what stories you want to see from the ones that we're reading. We will be starting on Thursday, October, um, Thursday, October, Thursday, August 22nd, which is a week ago today, today being the 29th. And um, if you want to read any of these articles, go to the blog, click on the date that you want to see of the article you want to see. We'll try to keep... Up on, well, some uh, of these are well worth reading, and yep. we're going to come across one later that I think is almost a must-read. Absolutely. I'll mention it. There's a, actually a couple of them. However, um, I also have to make the, do the commercial. Bingo. And uh, <laughs> basically what's happened is that... Um, the be, state in their wisdom. Yeah, the state. It's not the state of Vermont. It's the, it's the state of Washington, D.C. Donald Trump and his company have decided that the rules about public access television have changed, and the result of that is that uh, BCTV, which is where we record the show, has had its um, budget cut, in effect, well, I think or that its, the its funding cut. Community TV stations haven't been particularly, uh, how would you say, worshipful of uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the reason. I think he's just up to mischief. In fact, he might not even have known about this. He just uh, appointed a bunch of people who do things like this because they do things like this. Anyway, BCTV's funding was cut as a result of this, and so we have to come up with a little bit of money to, to fund the show, $480 a year. And um, that $480 has to come from someplace, and neither Tom nor I has any great amount of money, so we're asking people on television. And if you go to the BCTV website, which is brattleboroughtv.org, and you go down to the bottom of the screen, you can find a thing that says support local television. And well, it's not you, just for this show, it's, it's for everything you can, do. Yeah, and you click on that and you can pay with a credit card or PayPal, which are the best ways. When you pay, there's an opportunity a little bit lower than the amount that you put in on the screen to say, this is for Energy Week. That would be helpful. And if that happens, it gets credited to this show, and I will warn everybody in advance, even after we're fully funded, which we are not, we're about three quarters of the way, um, I will continue making um, uh, appeals because Energy Week could be fully funded, and if BCTV doesn't have enough money... It, BCTV does a lot of services for, for It absolutely for town, does, I mean. and so do other... Um, I, I, uh, I know a lot of people stations. watch the select board on BC. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They, they, you know, they talk about the town meeting. The town yeah. meeting can go on for eight hours, and people sit there and watch it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's important to them. It's vital. And, of course, there's about 140 people who go there and 
f pay very close attention or occasionally, as I do, fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to keep that to a minimum. But um, public access television in general across the United States needs support. So if you can't support BCTV or Energy Week, you can support whatever your local station is, and I will be grateful for that as well because it needs the support. Should it, we? It, 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 it benefits democracy. It benefits democracy, yes. absolutely. Yes. All of the select board meetings and town meetings and so you, forth. You get to know what's going on. That happen in eastern Wyndham County, well, not all of them, but many of them, um, appear on BCTV. And the people who live in the towns can see what's going on. You know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. It's not like Bennington where they hold these private sessions. <laughs> <laughs> they don't hold private sessions. They do. In Bennington? Yeah, the, set, the select board closes closes the, the sessions and you can't hear Well, what they, they do that in Brattleboro, too. There are, there are executive sessions in yeah. Brattleboro. There's rules about that. They have to tell you why they ha did that, and they have to... Um, there are certain things, like, for example, if they're discussing whether or not to sign a contract. I know that. You know, yeah, that's, in, that's written in. And there are certain rules about what they can exclude from public access yeah. and what they can't, and if they're, if they're, um, but ne don't believe conspiracy theories just because they're <laughs> conspiracy theories. Some conspiracy theories aren't true. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are. And some, are, I believe that there are some that are. I, my favorite conspiracy theory is the conspiracy theory that says that there are people out there who are actually purposely generating conspiracy theories that they know aren't true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should get going on this. I think we should. You and we have a picture, a picture here, up. which is a nice picture of a, of a farm. Um, it's not in Middlebury, but it's about 20 miles away, as I understand it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, this it's is not from, even that far. This is from Renewable Energy Magazine, which is um, a magazine that's picked up internationally. So this is not just a local item in local news, but it is local to Vermont. Well, Middlebury College and Project Partners celebrate groundbreaking for anaerobic di digester. And it's going to be a big one, as you can see yeah, by that picture. Yeah, absolutely. Representatives of Middlebury College, Vanguard Renewables, Vermont Gas, Goodrich Farm, and the state of Vermont gathered for a groundbreaking of the largest anaerobic digester east of the Mississippi River. Well, it's now, going to be all in that area on that the That area on, on the left. And you know, Tom, you made an, uh, an observation before we started the show, and people should hear it, I think, about every farm needing one of these? Well, I was thinking uh, that some sort of small anaerobic digester should be almost compulsory on a farm. Yeah. And it would bring in extra income for the farmer. There is, in the current edition of Green Energy Times, an advertisement for a home-sized anaerobic digester. Home scale. Okay, this was would be a little bit larger than that. I think. Uh, yeah, this one is. This one no, is. I mean a, the one that, that I'm recommending. A typical. Farm. Oh yeah, the one year for a farm would be would be very large compared to what you. Could, but the point is, the technology is available on a home scale. Yeah. And um, so although, we're talking about something in between. Yeah, and you know, doing research on this, I found out I couldn't get an actual number of how many anaerobic digesters there are in China. For I homes, bet you it is a lot. well, the lowest figure I could find said um, over a million. Wow! And the highest one said uh, five million. And these are anaerobic digesters. People are putting their household kitchen waste, basically, yeah. and scraps yeah. of that nature, things that can be digested, and other stuff into a into a container. And the container gives off what is in effect natural gas, which they use for cooking. They use that for cooking. Yeah. That's right. And um, a lot of people in, in China go for that. A lot of people in the United States would go for it if we had a digester that was available. The digesters, as I understand it, in, in Vermont, you've got to be careful that they're kept warm. Okay. They, they want to operate at a particular yeah. temperature or above. Yeah. And, and, you know, the germs, like, like, they don't like to get chilly. They, <laughs> they have a problem with bed socks or something. I don't know. Anyway. Um, I have seen, by the way, some of the Chinese digesters. Yes. They're about the size of a refrigerator. Really? Yeah. And they just, yeah. you know, they sit, they from, sit in the, near, near the back door. and. Uh, yeah. There, I've, we've had articles in, in Green Energy Times about household units that people have made. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was in New York State. 
And, um, you know, I think there's no standards involved in a thing like that, so it's something that you yeah. have to research kind of yeah. carefully. Yeah. Okay. More on that, or should we just go Yeah, on? let's see what I, I had. I had some notes here. The facility will combine cow manure and food waste. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> this thing just went out. Uh, cow manure and food waste to create renewable natural gas, which will travel by pipeline to Middlebury College's main power plant. Yeah, the pipeline was put in to carry natural gas for yeah, the Yeah, it's, it's already there. I mean, it's a pipeline, yeah. not just for this. The college yeah. also operates a biomass plant which provides some of the college's electricity, yes. separate from this. Yes. Middlebury plans to shift completely to the use of renewable energy by 2028. How, why would they pick up a, such a weird date? <laughs> Everybody by else the way, this farm here, I'll put the picture up again. Good idea. They have 900 milking cows, so it's, 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 not a, it's, it's a significant <laughs> farm. <laughs> I can just, you know, picture the piles of manure that 900 <laughs> cows have produced. Nice looking farm. When I was a little kid, you know, I spent time. Were you in, a kid? Uh, once upon oh, a time. I'll be darned. I spent time in cow barns. I'm very uh -huh. familiar with cow, cows. <laughs> never, never learned much about horses. Horses always kind of unnerve me because they're big animals and I don't understand what they're doing. Cows don't bother me. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica. Oh, this is a good one here. Yeah. Duke Energy spreads FUD, <laughs> which stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt about renewables in North Carolina. People get upset about this. The Re Environmental Working Group is calling out Duke Energy for its outrageous claim that introducing more solar power into the state will cause a surge in emissions. I They're read that. This is <laughs> ridiculous. Duke said emissions come from the natural gas plants ramping up and down. I got, I got a suggestion for you. Get a battery! <laughs> really? Well, so there, there, there's a couple of takeaways here. Duke Energy is the largest investor-owned utility in the United States. Yes. So there's nothing to sneeze at. Yes. The company's business model has been big centralized power plants. Yes. Okay. So their claim that renewable energy sources somehow increase air pollution and worsen the climate science is on its face ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I read that and I said, how did they think this one up? <laughs> well, actually, you know, what they're saying is they, they're having to ramp their yeah. natural gas and peaking plants up and during the time that they're down. ramping it and It gives and off down, more nitrous they, oxide. They shut off the controls. Well, they shut off, yeah. They, <laughs> they allow more emissions, and yeah. so they're allowing more emissions more often. And, they, you know, the, the, the cost of electricity from a battery is now lower than the cost of electricity from... Uh, from natural gas in many places, so so it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Why are you using? Well, natural Duke gas? Energy does not own the batteries. You know, they, <laughs> they can could. buy batteries. They could. They They've could got more it. money than I do, and I buy batteries. <laughs> I, I buy little rechargeable batteries that are, you know, they they should be buying big rechargeable batteries. Well, the state is currently getting ninety percent of its electricity from coal, gas, and nuclear. That's the problem. That's the problem. Okay. We have an item from Utility Middles, and who? Utility Middle another, East. Another picture coming. And we have, we do. We have a picture of a, of a solar array. A for the life of me, array. I cannot tell if that's real or an artist's rendering, but my bet is that it's an artist's I rendering. I would think so. I don't know what that is in the background there. That's city. Looks more like a graph, but I guess. It's yeah, a it city. does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. China looks inland to boost renewable energy deployment. China, which already accounts for 45% of all investments in renewables worldwide, will, will increase deployment of solar power schemes inland over the coming decade. Gansu and Xinjiang provinces will see the highest concentration of solar projections in the future. Obviously, the Chinese have not figured out that climate change is a Chinese hoax that was they built that to impose <laughs> the, on the United States ridiculous goals for renewable energy. No, well, they the haven't early, figured it out. The backstory here it explains it a little bit. The earlier efforts have been focused on the coastal areas. Right. Okay. Inland provinces have stronger irradiation levels, land available for solar power, and are cost competitive. Absolutely. So it makes sense. It does. It makes sense. But they've had tradition, historically, they've had problems with um, what the Indians call evacuation, 
which is evacuating the, the electricity out of the area where it's made. In other words, transmission. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true too. Yeah, they've, they've had to put up more and more uh, transmission lines. Well, China's a big country. It's it was fair, geographically large. Fairly large, <laughs> yes. Okay, we're up to Friday, August 23rd. This is interesting. The with future an item. of food. Yeah. You might want to put us up, Tom. Click on that her. thing. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> the future of food. What, is it, what else does it say? Why right? farming is moving indoors. Yeah, we've done stuff on this before, but, you know, every once in a while it comes up. Uh, ten shipping containers dominate a corner of a Brooklyn parking area. I want to point out, this is from BBC, and they're talking about Brooklyn. Um, each is full of climate control tech growing herbs that are distributed to local stores on bicycles. Yeah, there's a picture of that. Well, there's a lot of images in this article. Yes, there are. This is literally urban farming. Lighting, humidity, and temperature are all controlled in hydroponic indoor farming. And That's an idea whose time yeah, has come. I have a friend who does not like hydroponic farming. Uh, sorry because, for him. Well, <laughs> she she says, how do they know what to put in the in the you know the the fertilizing stuff? Do they keep track of you know things like how much I don't know. I think they keep track of almost everything. They they keep track of the stuff they know the plants need. Yeah. But there's stuff that they don't know the plants need, and they don't keep track of that. Okay. And um, so she, that's that's her problem. It isn't really natural. But I did an interview for Green Energy Times a couple of years ago of a, um, a people of s some people who own a, own a greenhouse called Leaf, L-E-F, with a long uh, mm -hmm. thing over the E, which is in New Hampshire. And they told me that they were able to get a million pounds of, pro of produce out of one acre greenhouse each I've year. I've heard this stuff like this before. The, 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 the yield is incredible. It's unbelievable. And when you do this in shipping containers in Brooklyn, <laughs> that means that you've got a million pounds per acre of this stuff. Ten shipping containers can feed a lot of people. Now, my you're friend... three miles away from Manhattan where they can use it. Use well, you're stuff. within bicycle range of everybody who's eating this stuff. Yeah. My friend, who doesn't like hydroponics, tasted the stuff from Leaf, and she said, this is amazing, it's so good. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, how about that? Okay. Well, for what it's worth here, the lot where this stuff is happening is right next to the housing project where rapper Jay-Z grew up. <laughs> I wonder if rapper Jay-Z has got anything to do with it. <laughs> and I found out why he is rapper Jay-Z. Oh, did you? Yeah, there's a subway train runs right by this housing project. Yes. And they, have, and they the, the, the names of the trains are the J and the Z. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and and his music is based on the sound of the of the wheels on the tracks going. I clack, guess it clack. is. Yeah, I guess. Screech, it is. screech, clack, clack. Okay. Well, there's stuff that's that I was going to say, but we've covered it already. Okay. We've got an item from CNN now. Well, the last sentence here: Produce is grown on trays stacked ceiling high. Yeah. Okay, so they use all the space, and everything is run by computers which control light, water, and nutrients. Yeah. And you can get a huge amount of growing area into a, a very, a, a small, very small space. They don't have to weed these things because there's no weeds, no weeds. around. Uh -huh. you know. Okay, we have a picture of Bernie Sanders. Is that, is that who that is? I think it is. <laughs> he looks very serious in that picture. He looks very familiar. Yeah. I've yelled at him. Have you? Yeah, I, I yelled, thank you, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what he's doing in this particular picture is he's unveiling a comp comprehensive $16.3 trillion Green New Deal plan. Yes. Amid the crisis. I want to crisis. point something out. This is a 10-year, $16.3 trillion plan. Is that, am, I, am I right on that? Or is it longer than that? Uh, I let think me, it's at least 10 years. Yeah, let me, let me read the thing. It says, Bernie Sanders added progressive meat to the bones of the Green New Deal with a the release of a comprehensive $16.3 trillion climate change program ahead of a, a campaign stop in Paradise, California, the city leveled by a devastating 2018 wild wildfire. And I know that there are people out there who are saying $16.3 trillion, where is he going to get that kind of money? Well, he talks about that. Yes, he sure does. We'll, we'll be talking about him again later. My first response to seeing that was, 
You're going to well, save more money. I wonder how much money that's going to yeah, save us. Bingo. <laughs> we will, we'll cover that again because there's yeah, more coming. Yeah, we will indeed. There's a nice three-minute video in this article yes. that's worth watching. It's a CNN. CNN always does a pretty good yes. job on their website. So he was an early backer of the Green New Deal that was introduced by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Earl Blumenauer. Yes. In a plan, we've talked about it, that calls for a World War II-style mobilization. Right. To halt and reverse the effects of global warming over a decade. Huh? Yes. <laughs> he promises to aggressively enforce the Clean Air Act, as opposed to our present incumbent. <laughs> Incumbent or incompetent? <laughs> to restrict dangerous emissions. But the proposals go much further. He would cut subsidies to fossil fuel companies, oh my God, and impose bans on extractive practices, including fracking and mountaintop removal, yeah, while and halting the import and export of coal, gas, and natural, coal, oil, and natural gas. Right. Sounds like it makes sense to well, me. Well, the thing is, if we don't pay a, a carbon tax now to get the carbon out of the environment, we're going to have to subsidize oil in the near future. We're doing it now. Yeah, I mean... Uh, subsidize it more. More. And I'm figuring that, that you know, the, the stuff that we've seen, projections that we've seen for the oil industry from, you know, the shipping industry and the banking industry and so forth tell us that we've got about five years of oil and after that it's going to be a problem. And for especially for Americans, because we are getting... We're running out of oil. But we're getting more dependent on it. And the rest of the world is reducing its dependent in, in dependency. And as a matter of fact, I don't, didn't put it into this week's show, but I've been seeing things saying the glut of natural gas in the United States is now across the world. People, the demand for natural gas is declining. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Let's move along here. We have an item from BBC. We do, we do. Amazon fires. This is scary. <laughs> Our is. house is burning. Macron warns ahead of G7. French President Emmanuel Macron said the record number of fires in the Amazon rainforest is an, quote, international crisis, end quote, that needs to top the agenda at this week's G7 summit. Brazil's President Jair Bol Bol uh, Bolsonaro said Macron's uh, call calls evoke, quote, a misplaced colonial mindset, end quote. Well, this guy, named Bolsonaro, is a Trump clone. He's, um... <laughs> He's a little, little bit on a extreme side down Well, there. They, today I saw that a former president of Brazil um, just said, this man is evil. Okay. And that's pretty straight <laughs> talking. Well, the largest... The largest rainforest in the world is a vital carbon store that slows down the pace of global warming. Yeah, in well, other words, not just a Brazilian we problem. are destroying, or we being worldwide, are destroying, our, not, not only are we putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but we're destroying the ability of the Earth to take it out again. It's a worldwide problem. It's it not a Brazilian problem. And as problem. a matter of fact, one article that I came across uh, in the last week said that the, the problem as much as people are focusing on this thing in Brazil, the pro pro problem is even worse in sub-Saharan Africa. Is it really? That's what they wow. said. Well, uh, satellite data has shown an increase of 85% this year in fires across Brazil's Amazon. Yeah. Okay, and we've seen pictures of it. We they're have. All over the place. Uh, okay? they're, they're horrible. Environmental groups say the fires are linked to Bolsonaro's policies. Well, they're man-made. This isn't caused by lightning. Yes. These fires are started by people trying to clear land. Right. And they're burning the, the forest down. and then they're, Or they have cleared the land and, and they're clearing, they're burning, they're burning the, the rubble. The debris. Yeah. So Bolsonaro has been suggesting that non-government organizations are starting the fires. Well, this is That's kind of crazy. Yeah. But he admitted he had no evidence for this claim. Now, the Amazon forest covers approximately 2 million square miles. The continental United States is 3 million square miles. So this is a pretty big forest. Yeah. It's bigger than Brattleboro, I'll tell you that. Well, certainly bigger than my backyard. Okay, we're up to Saturday, August 24th. Yeah, we have we an item another from, picture coming from up the New here. York Times. Hold your hats, guys. Yeah, hold your hats. There <laughs> it is. There it is. This is David Koch. 
in 2015 at an organization called Americans for Prosperity. Which is his organization. Which I think is all, also called Americans for the Worship of Mammon or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, this is a scary article. Yes. David Koch died at the age of 79. He is best known as a major funder of right-wing political causes from tax cuts to deregulation. He's an arts patron and a man about town. Well, I'm a man about town. Absolutely. <laughs> but to his critics, his most lasting political legacy might very well be the rapidly warming world that he left behind. Because he go. has done a lot. He's done a lot. Do. Thank you, Tom, for reading everything I was supposed to read. <laughs> oh, did I read that? I was thinking I was reading my notes. Duh. That's okay. Well, if you want, you can read my notes. No, that's okay. Read your notes. I, I, got a, I got a break there. Yeah, Coke Industries <laughs> is one of the largest private companies in the world. Yes. One business inside Coke Industries remains more important than the rest, and this is true, processing and selling fossil fuels. Yes. So Koch has financed a network of political activists, which he has done, to fight against any form of climate change legislation that would dampen the demand for you know, oil. When I started doing my blog, I found out very quickly that there's two flavors of news. One of them is news that is just across the spectrum on everything. It'll report one thing, it'll report the opposite. It'll say climate change is real, climate change is not real. Yeah. It, it's all over the place. Yeah. The other news organizations reported using absolutely identical um, ways of, of, uh, of getting information. Okay. And their information was not, it didn't support the people who said climate change isn't real. It may have said climate change was, was, is real, not real, but it did it in a different way and using different statistics. And I th said to myself, why is this? I mean... This, this, this is a, a dog bites man versus a man bites well, dog story. Well, here's the thing, Tom. Yeah. I see data, and I see more data that is identical to it or very, very, very similar. And then, you know, the other people who are saying climate change is not happening or renewables cost too much or, or whatever use different data. So I started getting this group of organizations, which included the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and so forth and so forth. These are all They're right wing. All funded by Coke Industries. Okay. And they <laughs> and you know I said I'd, I'd look at this data and I I put see, him up again. I saw a thing that said Move according this. to <laughs> according to the to the U.S. D Department of Energy. Solar power costs X, Y, Z, yeah, whatever yeah, the thing yeah. is. And then I'd say, but wait a minute. The, the price that comes from Lazard Associates, which is advising people on, on investments, that's what they do professionally. Yeah. They'd better be right or they're going to lose customers. Yeah. Is, is like 20% of that. Well, we're gonna and so what I, what I did was I started looking into these organizations. Okay. And they have a habit of reporting news from the US DOE that is four or five years old. Oh, okay. And you, you know, the Heritage Foundation does it, the Cato Institute does it. And I say, Which what? It supports their viewpoint. It supports their viewpoint, but it means that they can get data and say, it's real. It's absolutely yeah, real. Yeah. It comes from the USDOE. It's just very stale. It's stale. <laughs> it's it's uh, moldering. Humbly. You know, this is in a marketplace where if the data is six months old, it might be obsolescent. If it's, if it's a year old, years old, it's obsolete. <laughs> if it's five years old, Forget it was obsolete it. four years ago. Yeah. You know? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm we, got, we got a good one coming up. This is a very good article. It's a long, this is almost a must read. Okay, this is the one about Bernie Sanders? Yeah, parsing the 35-page, $116 trillion Green New Deal from Bernie Sanders. Yep. Bernie's plan is projected to cost $16 trillion over the next 15 years. Okay, so that's a trillion dollars a year. But Sanders says it will pay for itself by eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, requiring fossil fuel companies to pay the damage for their, uh, their products due, and adding tax benefits uh, for adding uh, 20, million new, 20 million new workers. So he's putting the money where his mouth is. This, the, the Green New Deal plan will provide us with the guidance for the biggest um, business opportunity that has ever happened. I've heard other people say that, yeah. 
And you, you know, the, you, people are, people are going to be saying, wait a minute, $16 trillion, where's that going to come from? Well, well he, explains he explains it. it. So right. <laughs> what he's saying is, if they're going to dump trash in your backyard, now we're going to make them pick the trash up. Duh. <laughs> we well, are not going to pay them subsidies while they're, they, they being people who are arguing against subsidies for everybody yeah, else. Yeah. And we're well, going to... Well, they got a business model, basically, that says privatize the profits and socialize the costs. Absolutely. Well, Bernie's plan is interesting. The yep. article is interesting. And there's a link in the article to the document itself. And I certainly recommend people read the article. And it's long. And if you have time, read the document. Because it's, it's, there's a lot of meat There's there. a lot of meat in that document. It's well worth reading. It's, it's one part, of a... partly a reprise <clears throat> of the New Deal at FDR used to help the nation, you know, pull the nation out of the depression. People for, forget what that was. My grandmother owned a house in Winchester, New Hampshire. Yeah. It, you know, and there was no electricity at that house when she bought it. Yeah. And um, it also had no plumbing <clears throat> because... I lived in a house like that once. <laughs> there, there wasn't any way to operate a well. There was a spring that was higher, but, um, the, you know, there was a pipe that came down to the to the kitchen and water from the spring just continually ran into a sink in, in the into, kitchen and yeah. over a barrier in that <laughs> sink into another sink and it went out and if you needed water you dippered it out and if you didn't you know <laughs> if you needed to wash you'd wash in that dry part of the thing but she got electricity and the cost of bringing that electricity to that house today from the nearest today. place that was had yeah. would have had electricity in those days probably would have been in the in the dozens of thousands of dollars scores of thousands because it's of happening in Vermont right still well Nancy Ray Mallory the editor of Green Energy Times lives off grid yeah <clears throat> she put an amount I, I don't know how much thirty five thousand dollars into a solar array and batteries and all that stuff so she, she could live off grid comfortably and the the alternative to that was to bring in electricity at a slightly higher price would it cost more than thirty five grand yeah. wow yeah <laughs> Well, let's see. We want to move on, or you well, got... a quick one here is not like doing nothing will cost nothing. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Assuming yeah, glad an you average that up. loss in gross dash, gross domestic product of one point five trillion dollars for fifteen years, the U.S. economy will suffer a decrease in a GDP of more than twenty two trillion. Okay. Uh, is this so worth this is doing? Six, <laughs> this, 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 this is going to cost sixteen trillion. So it saves money. It, it, according to Bernie, it does, and he talks about exactly that. And I think Bernie's probably right, although, you know, um, Charles Koch and maybe the ghost of his brother would argue that he was wrong. But of course, well, this, this is a quote from Bernie. Yeah, President Trump thinks that climate change is a hoax. <laughs> President Trump is dangerously, dangerously wrong. Demented. Climate change is an existential threat to the entire country and the entire world, and we must be extraordinarily aggressive. I should say demented in my opinion. I should okay. point out I am <laughs> I not... I wouldn't argue. <clears throat> yeah. I wouldn't argue. Okay. Well, let's move along we here. Move we move an we have a, picture here. A, an interesting picture. If you happen to be one of those people who casts bullets uh, so that you can shoot them, and a lot of people do, I've done it, um, that is not lead. That is uranium. I got news for you guys. I don't think if that's radioactive, those gloves are going to help very much. Actually, I will explain that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I can. Anti-radioactivity. No, no, now? they're not. But let's do the let's do the thing first. Japanese utility starts selling uranium fuel into a depressed market. This is from Business Recorder. Japan's nuclear operators are starting to sell some of their huge holdings of uranium fuel as chances fade of restarting any more reactors eight years after the Fukushima nuclear disaster. The sales are likely to depress the already weak uranium market further. Now, here's the deal. Believe it or not, uranium fuel is not particularly radioactive. Oh, it's not, huh? Okay. It, when you have used that fuel, you've split up the uranium at atoms into random isotopes. They know, they know what percentage of what yeah. is likely to appear. There's a bunch of different isotopes. But it's all kinds of things. And if you look at those isotopes as they split out and you actually track them, you find that, well, if you look just at a list of, ra of random isotopes, you'll, what you find is that 
most random isotopes have extremely short half-lives. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they I mean, know, there's, believe it or not, seconds, not I, I was astonished. There's like 17 known isotopes of hydrogen. Is it really? It's amazing, <laughs> but you know, get, how can you get seventeen? Well, you have to have you have to have hydrogen. equipment that can find them over the course of a billionth of a second. Oh, because okay. <laughs> yeah, they're disappearing quickly. These these isotopes don't last very long, and the and the short-lived isotopes are the ones that are the most radioactive because they they split a lot, and yeah, yeah. and when when they split, they split into other short-lived isotopes t t uh, typically. This uranium, which is a mix of uranium-235 and uranium-238, okay, the, the, the half-lives of these things are in millions and millions and millions of years. Mm -hmm. So holding that thing, well... Not going to bother you much. It's probably... I, I wouldn't do it, but it's probably not going to bother this person much. And why does he need, need those gloves? Well, uranium is poisonous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So that's what that is. But well, a little, little takeaway from the article. Yeah. Before Fukushima, Japan was the th world's third biggest u user of nuclear power. After the United States and France. Exactly. Yeah. And it's permanently shutting 40% of its facilities. Yep. So it's got a lot of fuel on hand, and that's what this article is all about. And as a matter Nobody of fact, wants it. Yeah. As, <laughs> as as this was happening, they were announcing. I forget the name of the of the of the plant. But they were announcing that they were going to shut down possibly as many of, as five of the seven reactors at the at the biggest power plant they've got permanently. Okay. You know, I mean, they're just they're going out of the nuclear business. They're doing it as slowly as they possibly can, because the alternative that they would have to do if they just shut it down or when they shut it down was to burn a lot of coal and natural gas, which they don't want to do. But so they got to kind of ease into this. They, that's what they feel. I think that it would be better if they just went into n renewables as fast as they possibly could. But they would argue, I think, that they're already going into renewables as fast as they possibly can. Okay. Well, moving along, we're up to Sunday. We are up to Sunday, August 25th, and we have an item from Truth Out. This is another long article. This is worth reading if you got the time. Yeah, it is. Can we reach 100% renewable energy in time to avert a climate catastrophe? And you know, this is this is fun actually. Okay. Mark Jacobson is a guy who is recognized as a serious expert on by, I should say recognized by by many people. The people who believe that climate change isn't happening will not recognize him as an expert. But he's a professor <laughs> at Stanford. That who, that's who Mark is. Yeah. Okay. He's a professor at Stanford. He is very accessible. I've sent him emails. He responds like 15 minutes later. Um, he, he um, uh, well, let me read this. This is from Truth Out. Mark J Jacobson is less depressed than he was a decade ago when he and Mark DeLucci wrote a, map, a road map for becoming 100% reliant on energy generated by water, wind, and sun by 2030. Which isn't a bad idea. Not a bad idea. And this is despite the precarious position that climate change put us in. Ten years ago, Mark Jacobson was saying, look, this is not difficult. This is not at all difficult. This We've, is about how you here's do the road map. <laughs> Go with it. Yeah. And today he's saying, well, you know, I would have gone faster, but we can still go with it. And my reaction to this is, 10 years ago, we had all the technology we needed to, to stop climate change. But, we, but they were a little bit more expensive than they are today. And we've delayed too much. So yeah, I'm going to say, we don't have all the technology that we need to, to, to stop climate change anymore because we've, we've dilly-dallied too long. But on the other hand, we will develop the technology. I am absolutely convinced. And it's cost competitive. It's not only is it cost competitive, but it's fun, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, some of the technology that we're going to develop is things like, like reforestation. Yep. For uh, uh, greening deserts. And there's going to be some real big opportunities for people well, we've to go talked, out and do things. about the uh, Sahara. Yeah, and reading the Sahara. The kids, you know, um, uh, the, in the last select board meeting here in Brattleboro, yeah. there were kids who came in with it asking the select board to to, to declare a, a climate, climate emergency. emergency. And I will tell you, those kids are terrified for their futures. And I, I don't blame them. Yeah, and you know, I was you're sitting paying there. Attention I was sitting there saying, 
Am I telling these kids that they should be terrified? You know, is this my fault? And I walked out, out for and I, I, I very quickly realized as they, as they left the select board and I stood among them, they didn't know who I was. <laughs> it's not my fault. Anyway, um, I have a message for them, which is the opportunities are opportunities to go out and do things that are important and fun. This is not like my father's generation that went out and stopped the, the Japanese and the Germans from, from encroaching on the rest of the world, which was important, but it wasn't all that much fun. For these kids, they've got opportunities that they can be proud of. I think so, and it's, it's directly impinging on their futures. It's directly impinging. They, they were talking about existential threat, yeah. which meant that when they went to the select board, they were saying, we are in fear for our lives. Yep. And that is literally what an existential threat says. And so, I don't know, I think the next... Well, this article basically is about things like batteries in electric cars. Yes, it is. Okay? And electricity only accounts for a fifth of the global energy consumption. Yes. The big one is transportation. Yes. Okay. And heating. Yep. And of course, the heating they can, they can take care of with uh, heat pumps. Yep. That, that's a plus. But uh, they're, they're going to have to similarly expand transportation alternatives, electric cars and stuff. Uh, yep. And the question is, will it happen fast enough? And that's a good question. That's a very important question to ask. Okay, Tom, we've got eight items left and okay. 17 and a half minutes to do it. I so. think we can do that. I think we can. Okay, we we've got, got a wild, coming up here. wild this is fire. A wildfire. In and case this you didn't is get it. This is from Salon. Not Ceylon, Salon. Salon. Yet another real estate related crisis has come up in California. You're supposed to say that. Parts of California <laughs> are too wildfire prone to insure. That's what yet I'm another, supposed to say. Yeah, yet another real estate related crisis has come up in California, but we're not talking about sky high home prices. According to newly released data, it's simply becoming too risky to insure homes in big swaths of the fire, wildfire prone state. So homeowners are having to turn to the state itself. Well, what's happening here is the insurance companies aren't renewing policies in areas that they say are likely to burn in wildfires. Mm -hmm. So the people are going to the state. They mm -hmm. go, the state has a program called Fair Access to Insurance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only problem is it costs about three times as much. Yeah. So it's... <laughs> This is not easy. This is not easy. But it, it's a reflection of things that have happened in other parts of the United States. The whole coast of Florida, for example, Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago included. It's going to be underwater. Yeah. How do you insure that again? Well, in the case of that, the federal government guarantees the insurance for those properties. But it's not three times as much money. No, but, it's not. But they're losing money. They're not they, making it. Well, they're, they're, they're 20, have to do something. They're 20 some odd billion dollars in the hole right now. Okay, so however, however their, their insurance rates have gone up by a factor, as I recall, of 47 since 1971. Uh, wow. It's a lot of increase. And, and they're uh, still losing money. Well, and, but on top of everything else, in 2003, they had to go out and say, wait a minute, we can't do this. We've, there are properties out there where we've already paid considerably more than the property is worth and it's still insured and they're doing it again so they had a thing that came that they changed the, the thing that says if you file for two um uh what do you call it where you get your money from the insurance company two claims, claims. if you file two claims in excess of a thousand dollars over a 10-year period your insurance is through yep well, that and makes sense what do you do with mar-a-lago if you can't insure it you don't sell, sell it. Sell marshmallows? Yeah. Okay. So we've we've looked at the wildfire. Do you have more on that? No. I got it. Okay. So we're up, up to CNN. This one's a little bit weird. This is more the than Democratic weird. Democratic National annoying. Committee votes against allowing candidates to participate in climate change debate. Huh? This is really annoying. <laughs> this is really annoying. Members of the National Democratic National Committee voted down a resolution that would have resulted in single-issue candidate debates. The issue of the climate crisis has been a f uh, focus of proposal for such a debate. So... Does it make sense? They don't want the candidates to debate on the, on the I, issue of climate change. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. And why, why, why would they take that position? 
for the life of me, I can't figure out. Well, they're getting paid. Okay, we were talking about conspiracy theories. Yeah. I think Tom, you and I should sit down and figure out a conspiracy theory. <laughs> well, let's talk about the next conspiracy. Okay, we're up to Monday, it, it August twenty-sixth. I'm sorry, it wasn't. It wasn't as eight. It was more. We're up to Monday, and we've got a picture of a polar bear. You can put it there up. Is. This is localnews8.com. It is that. That's a television station. Yep. Detroit Zoo plans to be powered by renewable energy by 2021. That's a good idea. Yep. Wind turbines and other solar and solar panels will soon be keeping the lights on at the D Detroit Zoo. The zoo says it'll be shifting to um, and being entirely powered by renewable energy. It will use DTE's MI Green Power program, DTE being the D D Detroit um, Electric. Detroit, yeah, Detroit Electric. Um, to get control. electricity from renewable sources coming online in 2020. So the uh, zoo is not going to be generating its own power. It's buying power. It's buying power that they guarantee yes. is, is renewable. Yep. It's like uh, I, cow power in Vermont. Yeah, I think all of this power is coming from Michigan. Yes, I, th I believe so. Okay, we should move on. Uh, BBC, we ha we actually have eight items now, which means we've got about a minute and a half, minute and a half for each one. Okay. We got twelve minutes. Mi yeah, I mis minute and a half. miscounted the last time. <laughs> Amazon fires G7 leaders close to agreeing to a plan to help. Uh, international leaders gathering at the G7 summit in the French town of Biarritz are report reportedly nearing an agreement to help fight fires in the Amazon rainforest. President um, Macron said a deal to provide technical and financial help was close. And unfortunately, they made the offer. And the president of Brazil said, you people are being colonialists. Yeah. We're turning the offer down. We're going to talk this about that later. just going on this and on. Nuts. It, it's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a good, very good site. Very interesting. There's pictures, a lot of pictures, and there's four short videos. Yes. And one of the videos is interesting. It's flying over the fire. Okay, so you got a bird's eye view of the fire. Yep. The, okay. The, the videos are good. Our next so let's item see if there's anything is from the San Francisco Chronicle. I'm pushing you to move on because <laughs> we've got to get, I want to get through all of our stuff. Well, Sanders says support the coal country while combating climate well, change. Well, he cares he about the coal miners. how to do that. He cares about the coal miners. Democratic presidential com uh, candidate Bernie S Sanders told voters in coal-producing Kentucky that it was possible to be a friend of coal miners while also being a believer in climate change and the need for cleaner energy sources to combat it. And these people are living in areas where there's opportunities for renewable power that are going untapped. And that's what he's doing. That's yeah. what he's talking about. He says, look, yeah. coal's over. Coal, get ri get you might get, as well get, get used it. to it. Coal's yep. over. Here's what you should do. We'll help you. Now, I have just, you, you uh, tell us where we're going on the next one because. The next one is Tuesday, August 27th. Okay, here we go, there we go. Tuesday, August 27th from the BBC, and we have it a picture here. It is from the BBC, here. we got another picture This is a here. burned area of the Amazon, and I don't think that was forest in that picture. There's forests in the background, but in the foreground, I don't see any big tree trunks, so I think that was, that was scrub. That was scrub. Yeah. yeah. So well, that's what's burning, really. It's mostly scrub that's yeah, burning there. Yeah. Amazon fires Brazil to reject G7 offer of $22 million in aid. And the, by the way, there's, a, there's almost 2,000 fires going there. Yeah. And it's impossible in many cases to locate them all because, as you said, it's scrub, but it's under a forest canopy. So you so, don't see it, so you don't see it from above. Smoke. Yeah. There's small, there are many, many, many small fires and some big ones. Um, the Brazilian government said it will reject the $22 million in aid from G7 countries to help tack it, tackle the Amazon rainforest fires. Brazilian officials gave no reason for turning down the money, but President uh, Bolsonaro accused France of treating Brazil like a colony. <laughs> this guy's nuts. Well, the political direction of governance in the Amazon is changing under Bolsonaro. Yeah. And he's quoting, these countries that send money here, they don't send it out of charity. They send it with the aim of interfering with our sovereignty. Interfering with his desires, I think, is more like it. Basically, oh, yeah. Uh, our next item is from The Driven. 
Yeah, I never heard of the driven. I hadn't either. ACT, and we'll find out what ACT means in a second, finalizes the shift to 100% renewables. Now eyes transition to electric vehicles. The Australian Capital Territory, Australia's equivalent of the District of Columbia. Yes, yeah, ACT equals DC. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And it actually is, I believe, a copy of the, the way it's that identical. we did things. It's, yeah. it's a separate, it's not a state, it's not a, it's yeah. a city, but it's a, its own It's territory. a dis district. Um, the ACT has a plan to decarbonize its transportation sector, which is picking up pace, and is set to take center stage as the territory is completing its shift to 100% renewable electricity and the first phase of its goal in, and the first phase of its goal to zero emissions by 2045. So they're, that's what they're getting to. They, they're basically done with, they're not actually done because as they shift to electric vehicles, they're gonna have to have more electricity. Well, right now they've lifted their share of renewables to 74% of electricity already. Right, so and they're, they're finishing track. it up. Okay, the and next- one of the things they're gonna do, and this is something we ought to do, newly leased vehicles for the government fleets will be 50% electric by 2020 and 100% right. by 2021. Right. And it makes sense economically. Absolutely. Our next item is from the Environmental Working Group, still August 27th. <laughs> uh, Trump skips the G7 climate meeting, slams renewable energy, but insists I'm an environmentalist. And I'm going to stick this one in here. The president of this environmental group says, and I'm the prime minister of Greenland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After skipping a key meeting on climate change at the G7 summit, Trump said he would not jeopardize oil, coal, and natural gas industry profits by promoting renewable energy. He also told reporters, quote, I'm an environmentalist, end quote. And you know what else he said? He what said else? that he, he, did, well, he, he said when they asked him about the, the climate meeting, he said, that's the next thing coming up. And then somebody said, uh, Mr. President, it just happened. And, <laughs> and the, the White House staff explained that he couldn't go to it because he was meeting with the leaders of um, the UK and Germany. And the, and the UK, leaders of the UK and Germany were at the meeting. I was just going to say, don't they go this to is a <laughs> This is a person who habitually makes things up. So, okay. Well, since, since taking office, he has aggressively sought to repeal domestic policies the, admi the Obama administration implemented to mm -hmm. decrease carbon emissions. I think it's just because of Obama. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. In 2017, he pulled out of the Paris Climate Pact. Okay, which he has yet about. actually to do that because that's not going to happen until after the election. Oh, officially. so you're only talking about it. We're, we're, we're scheduled to withdraw, but we aren't there yet. Okay, we're we up to Wednesday. Last, we got the last last day's articles here, and we got six minutes to go. So Two minutes can, each. We can do it. Um, August 28th. We a picture coming up, We too. do, indeed, and that that is a picture of a cucumber. I was just going to say, it looks like a cucumber to me. It's a cucumber <laughs> wrapped in a protective non-plastic wrapping. This is an interesting article from BioWaste to SCOBY packaging. Okay, this is from Clean Technica. Make Grow Lab has a material that can replace pl plastic, plastic packaging. Its SCOBY product is home compostable, has a shelf life of two years, is a microbial and oxygen barrier, is soluble, insoluble in water, and impermeable to water, and it is 100% free from pl plastic and microplastic, and SCOBY, SCOBY is even edible. Well, I looked into SCOBY because I wanted to find out what it was. And it's been around for a long time. It's just these people have figured out a way to use it. Yes. Okay, if yep. you're making kombucha, you use a culture of bacteria and yeast to ferment tea. Yes. And that culture is called a SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. Okay. And it's very similar to what we all know as Mother of Vinegar. There you go. Okay, it's mother of kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Mike Growlab is opening a large production facility to refine the end product of this SCOBY so that you can use it. And it forms on the top. So yeah. you can just skim it right off. Okay. We have an item here from KTLA. Project to give LA record cheap solar power is stymied by labor union concerns. We talked about this yeah, before. We did. Los Angeles has been sitting on a contract for record cheap solar power for over a month. 
City officials have declined to approve it because the city-run Utilities Labor Union raised concerns. It is still fuming over its decision to shut down three gas-fired po uh, power plants. I can this see why they're upset, but... This is a big contract. This is for 300 megawatts and, uh, what was it, 150 megawatts? Well, I got it. The Beacon Silver Project in Kern County delivers electricity to the Los Angeles Department of Water Power. It's doing that now. Yeah. Okay. Under a 25-year contract. You ready? You're sitting down? Hmm. Los Angeles would pay less than two cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. The lowest price ever paid for solar power in the United States, United States and cheaper yeah. than the cost of electricity for and, natural gas. And this contract would involve putting in a battery that will deliver power at, at 1.3 cents it per would kilowatt hour. Exactly. It would include at least 200 megawatts of lithium-ion batteries. There we go. Capable of storing solar power during the day and injecting it into the grid for four hours each night. And as you said, it's going to cost three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So the union is saying we don't want to do this, but the fact is the solar power and the battery combined so that you're actually paying the highest price that you would pay out of this deal is less expensive than the three power plants. Bingo. You know, it's a no-brainer. It, it really you is. You know, these guys are, they're just feeling their oats. Well, it's, it's you know, they're concerned about jobs for people oh, sure. working in those power plants. And I, that's, that's their job. Um, and I, I'm uh, nevertheless, you know, I can understand what they're doing, and I'm angry at them. <laughs> well, we got two minutes left, and we got the last item on the page, and we got a picture. To we do indeed. This is a picture of a, is. of a young woman who has been camping out. <laughs> well, if you look at what's going on, that's a tent. It looks like it. It is a tent. That's a yeah. tent on on board the ship. Yeah. And that's home sweet home for 14 days. That's what the caption says. Oh. Teen echo activist Greta Thunberg, or Thunberg, Thunberg. arrives in New Thunberg, yeah, arrives in New York after a two-week sail. Okay, teen echo activist Greta Thunberg to arrive in New York. Yeah, I just read that. Why am I reading it? <laughs> echo activist Greta Thunberg is expected to arrive in New York City on Wednesday. Well, yeah, Wednesday she did. was yesterday, yes, and she did. and she has arrived. Uh, two weeks after she set sail from the English coastline, Plymouth, to be exact. And part of her, as part of her campaign to pressure politicians to put climate change at the top of their agendas. This is from NBC New York. And she well, has made it across the ocean. We've mentioned that she's traveling on a 60-foot sailing yacht. Yes. Okay, it's outfitted with solar panels. So it, it gets its energy from the sun and so from turbines underwater. I thought the tur it had wind turbines. The article said underwater turbines. I think it's wind turbines. Uh, wind, well, under, either way, it's wind because the wind yeah. is powering a boat. Yeah. It, it, I thought it was wind you turbines be, too. But you might be right. Ahead. You might be right. In, in any case, uh, we're <laughs> the, the uh, solar panels and the turbines allowed her to make a, a zero carbon transatlantic journey. And then there's a whole bunch of people who are pointing out that the crew is going to have to fly back. And so it's it's not carbon free, and in fact, she would have been How better. How are they going to get the boat back? They'll have a different crew. crew. Oh, <laughs> and, and and she's got to go to Chile, and she's not going to go to Chile on a sailing yacht. I can tell you that. No, I, I'm sure. Of that. So how is she going to get there? Probably by plane. And how is she going to get back to to uh, S -S Sweden from New from the New World? Probably by plane. But she's making a point, and the point is ma being made to a lot of people, and they're, they're looking at it, and they're able to understand the point. And the point is, trans uh, flying is expensive in terms Very of... Very expensive. And so, is a, so is, a tr is a a passenger ship, and the carbon footprints of these things are huge. A flight across the Atlantic Ocean and back would, would probably add 25% to my carbon footprint for the well, year. Well, the trade winds are still blowing. And we have seen some proposals to bring back sailing ships to carry to carry merchandise. Yeah, large sailing ships. We are at our limit, Tom. I think so. Why don't you put us both up and we'll say good night or good morning or that. whatever we have to say. So uh, we hope you come back next time, and we hope you have a perfectly lovely week. That's what that says. Bye bye. Adios. <laughs>